The Symbolism of Jupiter Although Jupiter is described as a planet, its symbolism is that of a god. As we have seen with the other heavenly bodies, they were all named after the gods, not the other way round. Nevertheless, the physical planet is suitably impressive. It is the fifth planet from the Sun and the largest in the solar system. And a gas giant with a mass more than two and a half times that of all the other planets in the solar system combined. Furthermore, its appearance is regal, with spectacular brightly coloured clouds and intense storms. Some astronomers believe that it plays an important protecting role in using its massive gravity to capture or expel from the solar system many comets and asteroids that would otherwise threaten Earth and the inner planets. So a very suitable choice for the King of the Gods and God of the Sky, the God of Thunder, Lightning and Storms, and the god of law, order and justice, especially oaths, the sacred trust on which justice and good government depend. Correspondences Jupiter, the god, has many synonyms, correspondences, in the pantheons of various religious systems. To the Greeks, he was Zeus. To the Norse people, he was Thor, from which we get Thursday or Thor's Day. Within Hinduism, he is called Indra. In Lithuanian and Latvian mythology, he is Pakunas. In Slavic mythology, he is a Perun. In Celtic tradition, he is known as Taranis. In Babylonia, he was Marduk. In the Egyptian pantheon, Amun Ra. And Thuna, however, was the Anglo-Saxon god of just storms, lightning, and especially thunder. He was the son of Woden. And there appears to be an hypothesis that the Hebrew Adon, Lord, and Adonai, my Lord, still used as aliases of the god of Israel, Yahweh, are also correspondent names. And so we could continue. Jupiter's bird was the eagle, and in Jupiter's case the eagle was called Aquila. He has also obtained certain iconographic traits from the cultures of the ancient Near East, such as the scepter. A scepter is a staff or wand held by a ruling monarch as an item of imperial insignia, and this is an 1872 portrait of Emperor Pedro II of Brazil, holding his imperial scepter. A 
Overthrowing Jupiter Jupiter is a symbol of power and authority. And whether he is Zeus or Jupiter, Thor or Indus, he is never left alone, always having to face challenges to that power. Many of the myths are allegories of the types of challenge he faced, and we saw how these battles were also represented in chess. See our video, The Symbolism of Chess. But many are related to families and how generations battle one another for control. If we take Zeus rather than Indra, for example, he battles the giants, who fight the Olympian gods in a battle known as the Gigantomachy, Typhon, a giant serpentine creature with a hundred snaky fire-breathing heads who battles Zeus for control of the cosmos. A god conspiracy. In the Iliad, Homer tells of another attempted overthrow in which Hera, Poseidon and Athena conspire to overpower Zeus. All these tales serve to show that once you have power, you can never relax. There are monsters, competitors, and even people you thought you could trust, like your own family. There are allies, but no friends, when you are in a position of power. This is one of Henry VIII's wives, Catherine of Aragon. And allies can sometimes become enemies if they think their position is threatened. And this is Julius Caesar. And each time one needs the help of other people. Sometimes as powerful as you, sometimes not. Sometimes not even a god. As a whole, the myths invented around the gods are exciting lessons for those who seek power, status and wealth and tell many truths about just what having power means. Power and Virility A major lesson the myths surrounding Jupiter and Zeus provide us with is that the lust for power and control comes with an equal lust for sex. And it is sex, not love. Jupiter had a wife called Juno. Zeus's wife was called Hera. But both gods had numerous children by their wives and various lovers. And myths of their exploits were numerous. And this is one reason why the bull was one of the symbols, denoting both virility, power, and an ability to sire many progeny by any number of different females. According to Hesiod, for example, Zeus had seven wives. His first wife was the Oceanid Metis. Their daughter Athena would be born from Zeus's forehead. Zeus's next marriage was to his aunt and advisor Themis, who bore the Horai, the seasons, and the Morae, the fates. Zeus then married the Oceanid Urinome, who bore the three Charites, the graces. Zeus's fourth wife was his sister, Demeter, who bore Persephone. Zeus's fifth wife was his aunt, the titan Nemosine. He and Nemosine had the nine muses. Zeus's sixth wife was the titan Leto, who gave birth to Apollo and Artemis on the island of Delos. Zeus's seventh and final wife was his older sister Hera. By Hera, Zeus sired Ares, Hebe, Elethia, Hephaestus, Iris, the goddess of strife, Enyo and Angas. These days moral judgments are made, and religions call this promiscuous behaviour, even incest when applied to humans and not animals, conveniently forgetting the fact we are animals. But the lesson these myths attempted to convey was that those seeking power, money and control 
are generally not loving, but they are sex mad. And it does not end there, because marriage means nothing to a Jupiter Zeus. It is opportunity and lust that count. Zeus mated with several nymphs, for example, Maya and Dion, and many mortals, for example, Samili, Io, Europa, and Leda. Indeed, many of the Greek myths perfectly capture the nature of the Jupiter man, surrounded by hangers-on, completely lacking in conscience, unfaithful, inconstant, driven by a lust for power and status, wealth and control. And few seem to realise that for every Jupiter, there has to be an equally ruthless Juno. Many myths render Hera as jealous of Zeus's affairs and a consistent enemy of Zeus's mistresses and their children by him. This is the mortal Samili, who was burnt to a cinder as a result of Hera's scheming. For a time, a nymph named Echo had the job of distracting Hera from Jupiter and Zeus's affairs by talking incessantly. But when Hera discovered the deception, she cursed Echo to repeat the words of others. As such, Jupiter wives had to be as ruthless, scheming and powerful as Jupiter himself. The tragedy is that such lessons are not taught to naive girls who are actually only looking for love and a partner to share their life with. They are looking in the wrong place. The Necessity of the Jupiters So far, the role of the Jupiter figure sounds almost thankless. Indeed, Thomas Jefferson said so. Besieged on every side by those who want your wealth and power. Driven by an almost uncontrollable urge to procreate, but never enjoying the fruits of true love. This archetype must be one of the most lonely of all. Worse, the wealth and power never buys one's happiness or contentment. Your friends are not friends. All they want is to share your money. And the money buys nothing other than material goods that serve no deep down logging for genuine love and simple pleasures. But the Jupiter archetype is essential as they provide the focus for the creative. Without the power and wealth of the patron, like Pope Julius II, the imaginative, gifted individuals who serve to create a better world would not exist. Pope Julius II reigned 1503 to 1513, for example, commissioned the painting of the Sistine Chapel ceiling by Michelangelo, various rooms by Raphael in the Apostolic Palace, the rebuilding of St. Peter's in Rome, and the establishment of the Vatican Museums. And yet he was one of the most powerful and influential popes, diplomatically and politically. Nicknamed the Warrior Pope or the Fearsome Pope, he emulated Julius Caesar. Machiavelli even described him as an ideal prince. But his money-raising ventures would be looked on today as totally unethical. Pope Julius II allowed people seeking indulgences to donate money to the church. That money was used for the construction of St. Peter's Basilica, although this indulgence is one from 1948. A 
overall, the gods, that is the symbolic planets, are far more realistic archetypes of people than many psychological profiles. Just as the Saturn archetype, in his role as the Tarot Hermit, and his role as Enneagram Type 5, exists in life, and is an essential support role for the Enneagram Type 4, the Tarot Hangman, the Jupiter Archetype, immoral, scheming, power-hungry, cunning, and ruthless as he is, is an essential patron, ready to be a true Tarot Emperor. And Enneagram Type 3 As long as he recognises this, the so-called failings of such men and women, and this is Genghis Khan, the founder and emperor of the largest land empire in history, are only failings when they apply their talents to creating an organisation that serves only themselves and their ego. There will always be opposition, and always people trying to take that power away. This is Napoleon, but often it is only to replace one Jupiter by another. The Jupiter archetype is always there. The danger is that we don't teach the young this fact of life. After all, when Hades asked Zeus if he could marry Zeus's daughter, Persephone, Zeus approved and even advised Hades to abduct her. And this is Demeter, incensed that Zeus gave his approval for the abduction. And when Zeus had an affair with Semele, he rediscovered it when Semele later became pregnant. And she persuaded Semele to sleep with Zeus in his true form. But when Zeus showed his true form to Semele, she burned to death. Chasing wealth and power can be a deadly game. 